My first experience of the Edinburgh Festival was in 1963. I was 17. I went to so many shows, fringe shows, and it was just extraordinary. It's a fantastic introduction to culture, in a way. When I first got to Britain from Swaziland in 1982, I went. Uh, I got here in April, and I went straight to the festival that summer uh, because of its legend. I've kind of launched a, a, my career here, actually, in in many ways. The first one I did was 1984. It's astonishing how many people have started here, how many people have uh, set up their stall and and. and sold their wares for the first time in this place. I was a reporter in the newsroom of the Daily Bugle. In a curious kind of way, I'm really rather thrilled. <laughs> oh, master mine, I am in all affected as yourself. The reason they do that is because the audiences are so extraordinary. There's no audience like it. It's like if, if, if you stand up on George Street or, or Prince Street or, or, or up the mound, you, 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 the, you're engulfed in a sort of tidal wave of people hungry for theatre. A thief, the tranchable scream. A crook, a pirate, a brigand, a rustler. Edinburgh, to me, represents everything that's best about all the arts. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to a very special edition of EICC's Free to Attend Innovation Nation. Tonight we mark the 70th anniversary of three of Edinburgh's world-famous festivals, the International, the Fringe and Film Festivals. And we're thrilled to have the directors of all three with us this evening, all of whom play a major part in the success of their respective festivals. Throughout the year here at EICC, we host some of the world's largest corporate companies and international associations, who all bring their conferences and exhibitions to Edinburgh. In August, however, we undertake a remarkable transformation into Venue 150, when we become part of the world's biggest and best cultural arts festival, hosting international artists of all genres. And this year is no exception we have a very full and exciting lineup to look forward to. So we have a lot to pack in this evening, um, but before I introduce your host to you, if I could just ask that when you ask your questions later on, that you wait for the roving mics to come near you or nobody will hear your questions. Um, so without further ado, it gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce your host for this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Cabinet Secretary for Culture, Tourism and External Affairs, Fiona Hislop. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. As we all know, 2017 is the 70th anniversary of the Edinburgh's first festivals, a pivotal moment in time which has resonated across the globe. Uh, on the 15th of June, I led a debate in the Scottish Parliament to pay tribute to the 70th anniversary of the festivals and to pay tribute particularly to Rudolf Bing, who co-founded the International Festival along with um, Henry Harvey Wood and Sidney Newman and with other civic leaders, particularly uh, Sir John Faulkner, whose ambition was for the festival to provide a platform for the flowering of the human spirit and in the aftermath of World War II, uh, where arts and culture were seen at that point by these great thinkers uh, to be a pivotal means to reimagine a new and better world. And perhaps what better time now than for arts and culture to reimagine a new and better world. 
Bing's vision was a festival programme that would embrace the opportunities uh, to make the festival a major preoccupation in the heart and home of citizens. And of course, the impact of that first festival resonated across the city and around the world and was a catalyst for the formation of Edinburgh's family of festivals and indeed festivals across the world. And that impact uh, is even made up into the current day uh, and where the importance of the festivals have been recognised through the recently announced City Deal for Edinburgh, uh, where we're reinforcing Edinburgh's reputation as a leading centre for music and the performing arts through investment, through the impact uh, project for a new performance space uh, here in the city. And I'm delighted to be involved right from the start in the early days of discussion and that the Scottish Government has provided £10 million for that new uh, investment. So tonight, bringing us up to date, but also probably as importantly reflecting on those 70 years and indeed the range and quality of what we've received and enjoyed in those 70 years, we have the directors of the founding festivals. And as each director joins me on stage, we're going to see a short film from each of their festivals. So first of all, can I invite Fergus Linehan, Artistic Director of the Edinburgh International Festival, to join me on stage. Fergus. Once again, Edinburgh opens her gates to the world for her annual International Festival of Music and Drama. We've uh, seen a short film about this year's festival, but uh, we're also marking the 70th anniversary. So what was so important about the 1947 festival and what are your reflections on why it's been so important? Um, <clears throat> well, it's interesting because, you know, everyone always asks the question, why Edinburgh? Why, why did it take root in Edinburgh and why, did, why, why not other cities? Um, and it's, I think, a combination of, you know, inspiration and good luck, really. I think there's a whole, a whole range of reasons. I mean, it was very interesting because I was doing, we did, launched in the Assembly Hall on the Mound this year, and I was waiting backstage, and I was looking at all the minutes of all of the meetings going back at the Assembly Hall. You read them all? I did, yeah. yeah. So I plucked out 1947, and I just opened it up, and it was saying that, it was saying that, we really hadn't spent enough time focusing on Europe. We'd been looking at other places, and it really was time for us to consider that we'd sort of left the field of play, and we hadn't been giving these things enough consideration. So there was something in the ether in 47 where there was, it was sort of stepping into a vacuum, I think. You know, we've got to remember this is a time before the many of the kind of both international and European institutions um, that we take for granted today. So I think that it captured something, and in a sense, Possibly because it wasn't about an art form. You know, Avignon was about theatre and um, Venice was about visual art and Cannes was about mm -hmm. film. But because it was about something broader than that, I think it became this kind of broad canvas. And therefore, as everyone started to move in, it could incorporate that because it was founded on that. I think had we just been an opera festival or had we just been a film festival or something like yeah, that, mm -hmm. um, I think the other, the other thing that's true about it is it's Edinburgh. I mean, the actual, the city itself is, you know, I, just, I always have to take myself out of my job and go back to when I used to come here. It is the most incredible festival location. I mean, when you come up that ramp up from the train station, you know, your heart soars. And so it's a combination, I think, of geography, of kind of inspiration, but I think most pointedly, the way in which it spoke to something that all of the arts could engage with. Um, and, and that just let it develop and let it grow. And I think it's still, when you actually come back to it, that's still what, what drives the decision making today. You know, on a day to day basis, you think, oh, that all sounds rather pleasant but antiquated. But it still actually does kind of drive your day to day decision making. So the heart and the soul is still there. Yeah, I mean, it is the, the DNA of it is still around 
this idea of of internationalism and around i mean i think i think the fact that this was the home of the scottish enlightenment is not just purely coincidental as well i think that um, this is this is a capital city that has always looked out to the world um, and so it was it, it i think it, it took hold in that regard in a, in a way it might not have elsewhere and of course it wasn't just the international festival it was also the fringe and so ladies and gentlemen uh, could we now uh, welcome to the stage shona mccarthy uh, who is the chief exec executive of the festival fringe society shona As a whole, it's just one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. The great playground of the imagination. It's like a massive funhouse. You feel like you've arrived. This is 70 years on the Edinburgh Festival Fringe. Seventy! It's just so breathtaking. So many talented performers in one place. It's one of the most important melting pots or ideas in the world. You get to see some of the most exciting and thrilling performances. You can get anything. You can go see anything. You've got circus, you've got dance, you've got cabaret. Comedians, actors, buskers. From a serious drama to juggling to a clown act to a naked drag queen. Any conceivable thing is worth a try. They cater for every taste. It's the, the rule letter of let's go in and we don't know what it's about, but let's just go and watch it. And if it's good, people will see it. 70th anniversary. What an amazing event. You really couldn't have found a city with a more exciting vibe. There's just such a buzz about the place. You're meeting people from all over the world every day. You can't fail to be swept up with the atmosphere. It is kind of magnetic. I've never seen so many venues in my life. Even in telephone boxes, in the back of cabs, people are putting on shows. It's wonderful, you never know what you're gonna see. For a comedian, the fringe is like Christmas. We plan our entire year around it. I just find the whole thing so bloody exciting. I want to do the fringe every year for the rest of my life. It's <laughs> bigger and better and more international than any other festival. I enjoy it so much. It's the only time in my life I've actually met the general public. This was the, and continues to be, the, the great, great, great granddaddy. This is the biggest arts festival out there. And it's a joy to be part of it. I just love it. I'd like to take this opportunity to wish the Edinburgh Fringe a very happy anniversary. Happy 70th anniversary, Edinburgh Fringe. You did it. Well done. You're brilliant. <laughs> Happy anniversary to the Fringe! Hip hip hooray! Place to discover, place to be discovered, can't be beaten anywhere. Happy 70th Edinburgh Fringe! I love you. You're 70, which is, 70 is really like the new 35. You've never been creaky, but you've always been freaky. Hopefully there's many more to come. Congratulations on the timeless wonderment that is the Edinburgh Fringe. Edinburgh Festival Fringe, I love you. Long may you go forward. So Shona, 70 is the new 35, mm -hmm. but uh, can we maybe go back to uh, 70 years ago? What sort of particular interest do you think um, to you personally about the start of the Fringe? Well, there, there's a number of things. I think, I think the fact that it was an act of defiance in the first place, and we come back to that this year in the 70th anniversary, um, that it was about a six, six Scottish companies, two English companies deciding that they wanted to perform, they wanted to be part of that whole kind of reconnection of Europe through culture, um, and that they would do it anyway. Um, so, so there was that, there was the fact that it was six Scottish companies and two English companies and that still stands true today, still there's a huge amount of participation from right across the UK as well as the incredible platform for Scottish artists as well. Um, but fundamentally for me the thing that drew me personally to it, um, both as a punter and now in this role, um, was the open access principle. Um, the idea that anyone with a story to tell, anyone who wanted to express an idea creatively um, could come to the fringe and do it, um, as long as they find a venue to perform in. And that open access principle still stands true today. Um, and I guess 
for me that's the most exciting thing about it but having said that I certainly do not want to go to the fringe every year of my life for the rest of my life <laughs> why not <laughs> I'd great to see Ricky DeMarco there obviously yeah. you know, his sense of uh, defiance himself and that political uh, element as well in terms of the, the changes that were happening uh, particularly in the 70s and the importance of the fringe as well to, to see people sort of taking the opportunities to express whether it's Margaret Thatcher I suppose or in other ways but the fringe has seen a whole range of different uh, politics uh, represented and challenged at different points during, during this period. And again 70 years later this year is no exception you know you've got everything from kind of Trumpageddon to uh, Brexit, the musical, to um, you know every kind of uh, subject that relates to um, being human um, in 2017 is covered in some way or other, either through comedy or through theatre or through new writing or through music um, in the fringe, and uh, it still to me has that real kind of political edginess. Um, uh, nothing is sacred, um, anything can be discussed, anything can be explored and anything can happen. Okay, thank you Shona. And now I'm delighted to uh, invite Ken Hay, the Chief Executive of the Edinburgh International Film Festival and the Centre for the Moving Image, onto the stage. The festival was in June, another successful year, the longest running uh, international film festival anywhere in the world. Um, you spent a lot of time during the festival with your Memories Project, thinking through that history. Uh, what particularly was uh, important to you and what impressed you? Um, I think 70 years is quite a long time. Just the, the, the quick correction is we're not the, the longest running, but the longest continue running. Venice and Cannes started before us, but have had breaks in between times. Continuous running then. Absolutely. But I just had to make sure in case there's any journalists here <laughs> who might pick me up. Um, the, I think the, one of the key things that started off originally as a documentary film festival, which is very much based on one of the key strengths that Scotland had back in 1947 in terms of filmmaking was in documentary. And John Grierson, who was the father, the, the grandfather of documentary filmmaking, born and brought up in Scotland, co-founded the National Film Board of Canada, very much determined what future documentary uh, was. Um, and it recognised the film festival's place in promoting and developing Scottish filmmaking, <coughs> but in the context of international filmmaking. And yes, year one was purely about documentary, but ever since then, as it's opened further and further to uh, more and more genres, more and more uh, types of storytelling on film, it's retained that core of documentary. So documentary continues to be one of the core elements of the festival to this day. We have a major documentary award uh, each year within the festival. And it's that, even though the festival itself has evolved hugely, and just looking at some of the images up there, I don't think much of that would have been happening in 1947, but that core strand through over the 70 years has been key. And the reputation of the film festival um, you know, and particularly its early days and the connection with Canada. I was, I was very struck with that. Was, um, we had the celebrations of, you know, from McLaren and all the rest of the different kind of um, events. And I think there really is something special about the legacy of the heritage 
as well and the reach that it has. And that's something that I think you continue to, to those relationships. It's not just about the film, it's about the relationships you support. As yes, well. and I think that you know, the, the basis of the festival is bringing people together. Yes, we come in nice big spaces, dark spaces, watch films of all different kinds. But it's about trying to break down the barriers between the what in the whole is a two-dimensional image um, with an audience by having the filmmakers on stage. You saw the Q&As happening there. We introduced the uh, filmmaker guests. Um, but it's also recognising as a platform for showcasing new films and bringing filmmakers together so they can start collaborating more as well. And that's, again, one of the things that has evolved further and further over the years is the platform that the film festival provides for bringing people together from across the world and then off they go and do fantastic things thereafter. And then hopefully at some point in the future, bring their next project back to Edinburgh five, ten years down the line. So now we have you all three together. Can we first of all congratulate all three of the festivals on their 70th anniversary? <laughs> So on the topic of internationalism in particular, uh, you've already made some reference to that. How important is it to you? We've had you know, 70 different nations represented from a government's perspective. I mean, uh, we've had last year, we met with 19 different uh, governments. Uh, the year before 27, when we had the International Culture Summit. So the representation is very important. The showcasing that we have, there are so many countries that now choose to have their own showcases here. So yes, it's about Edinburgh, it's about Scotland, it is about an international festival, but also the role it plays on the global stage. Perhaps you might want to reflect, all of you, about what your, your impact and your impression is of what the festivals ha can and do deliver on that. Perhaps. I mean, it's an, it's an interesting time at the moment because, you know, globalism has a bad rap at the minute or is getting a bad rap and, you know, famously, the Prime Minister said, you know, if you believe you're a citizen of the world, you're a citizen of nowhere. And I think that <clears throat> one of the things with the festivals is <clears throat> you come and you bring your own culture. So it's the idea of being capable of having kind of multiple kind of identities that you can just because you believe yourself to be part of this global gathering doesn't mean you feel any less Irish or any less Scottish. Um, and I think that that's, that's a very important part of this is that it's no one is sort of suggesting that we just end up with this kind of big international blancmange of culture. Everyone can sit very comfortably and very confidently within it. And so what it tends to be is it's, it's a sharing. And, um, and I think that as we begin to kind of figure out some of what we're dealing with at the moment, I think that's, that's very, very important. And, you know, that whole question of, of being able to feel very connected into your own roots, but to be able to say, I am an Edinburgher, I am... Scottish, I maybe feel I'm British, I'm European, and I'm whatever. To be able to kind of work through those different areas of identity, I think this is a great place to do that. Um, and as I said, I think, I think that's in the contradiction of this idea that to be an internationalist is in some sense to have no roots or sense of your own grounding or your own community. That's an interesting, my reflections politically is that you know, I'm an internationalist and that's why I'm also a nationalist. Uh, and I'm a member of the party I'm a, a member of. I don't see there's a contradiction in that at all. But that's quite a, a challenging concept for some people. But in Scotland, we know even from our census that the idea of being able to hold multiple identities in your head at one time is actually so natural in Scotland. So therefore, you know, I think that that's completely possible. And the, the big yellow um, posters, yes, you know, last year, you know, having gone through the, the Brexit vote and coming out, I think the one thing that uplifted my heart was coming into Edinburgh and seeing the big yellow posters of Welcome the World because that, I think, had spoken lots of different uh, levels to, to, to all of us. But, uh, Sean, I mean, you obviously have to deal with so many different uh, nationalities in, in terms of in something that obviously is not curated. So therefore, how, how, how does that work now compared to perhaps in the past? I think it was one of the things that coming into it, you know, fresh and new that I kind of really realised this year was that it wasn't just the 70th anniversary of the festivals here, but in the case of the Fringe, it was the 70th anniversary of the whole Fringe concept. Uh, because as, as most people will know, there are hundreds of fringe festivals around the world now and that idea of fringe has been taken and emulated across every single continent. 
So we used the opportunity this year to celebrate that idea of a collective. Um, last year we hosted World Fringe Congress in Montreal and there were 65 of the organizations like ours from around the world represented at that and we put it out there, you know, in the kind of global climate we find ourselves in, how can we work to the collective of all of these incredible kind of platforms for artists to express themselves freely? And it was actually the guy from Paris Fringe who came back and said, why don't we do a World Fringe Day? And we said, okay, we will. And what um, happened? What, what, what? Um, it, was, it was a kind of an invitation. We created the digital platform and it was an invitation to the hundreds of fringe festivals around the world to, on, on one day, the 11th of July, to use that day to celebrate um, these platforms that, that are provided now across the world for artists to perform. Um, and we, 101 of them responded um, creatively in different ways. So Adelaide threw a massive Keeley um, and filmed it back to us. And it really seemed to capture a kind of global imagination. And I don't know whether that is just because of the climate we find ourselves in right now. Uh, but the legacy of that is that there is now a digital platform through which all of these fringe festivals can now connect, uh, can um, upload content and can share ideas and thinking. Um, so it was, it, it was kind of really exciting for us. And uh, in this year, when I suppose all of us were a bit worried about the impacts of Brexit and other things, we've got 62 different countries um, actively participating in showcases, some of the ones you described yeah. uh, at the fringe, and that's 30% up on the representation internationally last year. So 30? 30, over 30% mm -hmm. up on last year. So That's a statement in itself. It's really, yeah. it's, it's, it's the thing we're most proud of this year. And you know, we know from the Thunder Hughes report that the importance of staying competitive is really important for all the festivals and for Edinburgh as a festival city. So I think people are quite surprised how, uh, instead of being selfish and competitive, the festivals are actually quite collaborative and cooperative and in sharing mutual support and learning. And I wonder, you know, in terms of um, the different activities that happen, I know, obviously, in terms of the Momentum programme that I, you know, I, I speak to many of the delegates that are there, um, that's quite surprising to people about how cooperative it is. Is that something that you get? I mean, I certainly hear that from other culture ministers and uh, internationally in terms of the, your work with other countries. And I know, obviously, you know, having countries of focus, uh, Poland obviously was this year, but you've had as you talk, some of the work with the Indian filmmakers in particular. It was quite interesting. Is there anything in that? that you can well, I suppose a, a, a couple of things. I mean, just on the international aspect, um, film by its nature is international. You can, if you to get a film made these days, a feature film made, you will inevitably have money from more than one country. Yeah, you will have yeah. talent from more than one country, technical crew from more than one country. You're obviously hoping it's seen in more than one, one country. country. So you're then moving into the whole distribution exhibition side of it as well. And we are a platform within a, quite a complex global system. Um, and what we have to do is constantly reinvent ourselves and evolve to make ourselves relevant for an industry that you mentioned digital earlier, is having to face the, the, um, the opportunities in a lot of ways, but huge threats, but a complete change in the business model of film um, and how we address that, how we provide that platform. The international bit is there, whilst others show films and that whole showcase of films, there's endless film festivals everywhere in the world. There's very few film festivals that allow that platform for debate and discussion from the industry practitioners. So this, each year we host an industry uh, program. This year we had 600 industry delegates from 29 countries attending that. Um, within the festival as a whole, we had, I'm just checking my notes to make sure I get it correct, um, across the uh, different films we had 46 countries represented, but 52 countries represented in the industry guests that came to the festival. Um, and I think the final bit on international was just around it's the teams that produce the festivals and that we've got 24 countries represented in our staff team, staff and volunteer team that make the festival each year. They, some tour the world, they do three months with us, three months with someone else, three months with someone else and that's great. Um, others are based in Edinburgh, they've come to Edinburgh because it's a fantastic city, it's a culturally rich, culturally engaged uh, city that in my experience as someone who's born and brought up here, but having traveled quite extensively, is second to none. It's, it's a tiny city compared to most. 
a big <laughs> what you'd expect it to be compared to anywhere else. And yet so much happens here. The audiences in Edinburgh are so culturally engaged. You know, why Edinburgh? Well, actually, it's what they were doing already. If you're going to put on obscure comedy, obscure opera, obscure film, they'll give it a go. If you do it in other parts of the world, they'll go, hmm, I'm not really sure about that. And I think that's what, one of the things that makes us different. The bit about working collaboratively, I think there was always healthy competition. Um, and it took quite a long time for us to get our acts together. In some ways, being older helps. It gives you more time to have a degree of organisational wisdom. Um, and the recognition with the, the original Thundering Hooves report um, and the creation of Festivals Edinburgh has been absolutely instrumental in driving the success of the festivals over the last 10 years because it very simply allows us to present a single message to key people, including cabinet secretaries, including local authorities, including a broader range of stakeholders for want of a better uh, description. Um, why is Edinburgh important? Because we deliver success. Why are the festivals important for Edinburgh? Because we deliver success educationally, socially, culturally, but economically as well. And it therefore means we're able to tap different buttons depending on the different people we're speaking to. And you know, with the greatest respect to directors and chief executives, I think your point about it, it's about people, it's about the teams, it's about the people who make this happen, it's the artists. And that's the, the coming back, I think, to, to that strength of that international message. We need the international uh, input from uh, people from right across the world uh, to make the success that is Scotland, that is uh, creativity and artistic. And I know, Fergus, you've, you've, you've made reference before to the importance of that. And therefore, in the Brexit discussions, it's absolutely essential that mm. the, not, it's not just an economic value, there's a creative spark that can only happen with that exposure uh, to, to international experience mm. in the teams that are producing, but also clearly in the artists as well. I mean, so you're saying about <coughs> that the welcome world, and we were thinking a lot about that, and, you know, and I guess being Irish, the importance of that word falcher, and obviously it's yeah. a big word here, and, and, and as emigrant nations, you know, as, as nations that sent people out into the world, the importance of welcoming people back. Um, and that, that, that kind of, that, that idea that, you know, the kind of building, building entire kind of countries and continents. Um, and I think that that's very important. I think that it's, it, it runs, it certainly, you know, I could speak for Ireland. I think I've lived here long enough to know that runs very deep as well. That notion we all have cousins and uncles and aunts and far-flung mm. places. And so we have a kind of a natural connection with that. And, you know, sometimes we know that that strengthens the link back home. But um, I think it, it leads to a certain kind of view of the world, which is, is not insular. It can't be insular. Um, and therefore, you know, you've got... You, you, you kind of have two nations in a sense. You've got your nation back home and then you've got your emigrant nation, which you know, can be multiple sizes mm. of, of, of what's here. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think I was referring to uh, previously, that, that, that sense of having uh, two identities because historically we have had people that have been away and back and forwards and backwards. That you know, you could, there is something in Gaelic as well in terms of that relationship to um, a, a sense of another place as well as, uh, as home, because so many people have emigrated. And it is a sense of an, emigra an emigrant a nation has that sense of return. And, and, Which is and why I think, I think Falce becomes incredibly important as a word. It becomes a very, very kind of emotionally charged word And have you seen people. the entrance to the exhibition centre? I don't know how many languages there are, but I was compliment Marshall on the, on the international <laughs> welcomes that you have at the door. Just moving on now to, to um, I suppose, our involvement, the Scottish Government. Uh, it was when I was uh, uh, an opposition, uh, Lothian's MSP, Kerry McCaskill, and I uh, put forward the idea of funding for the festivals. It, it then transpired to be the Expo Fund. Uh, since 2008, that's £19 million supporting the festivals, recognising the cultural and economic uh, driver that they are, uh, but also to, to maybe provide a bit more opportunity. And I know, obviously, that it's been used in different ways. We've heard about the, the, the World Fringe uh, Day. Uh, perhaps uh, you might want to explain what, how you're using this year's particular Expo Fund in terms of the, the enhancement to, to help the, celebrate. So we've got... Um Two things we're looking at doing with uh, the, the, the Enhanced Fund this year. For, uh, first of all, we're, we're proposing uh, hosting a 
organising and hosting a conference in Scotland, in a, a city that isn't Edinburgh, a number of details still to be sorted, you'll understand, um, which invites all the key uh, festival programmers, cultural programmers from across Scotland to that city to uh, share, share knowledge, share experience, make connections, um, but have us as the, the centrepiece. Not that we know everything, not that we're experts by any means. We are very much organisations who constantly learn and gobble up other people's ideas and, and so on. But on the basis that we do recognise that we have a leadership role in, uh, in Scotland, uh, that the festivals are key organisations in making sure that Scotland, not just Edinburgh, but Scotland remains a culturally diverse, culturally exciting, culturally innovative uh, country. Um, and it's how we can be the catalyst to allow that conversation to happen and how we can support outcomes from it, but also how, what we can learn from it as well. And it links into the notion of our role in a broader Scotland, that it's not just Edinburgh, Edinburgh's lovely. It's a lovely city, lovely audiences, beautiful people. It's great. Um, but we are for the whole of the country. And how do we ensure that we're demonstrating that? Um, it will allow us, we're in parallel looking at uh, potentially some kind of pop-up type festival event that would bring uh, programmes, screenings, workshops, uh, education events and so on together. Um, and it would uh, allow us to test out what may or may not work in other parts of the country. We, as Centre for the Moving Image Hat, uh, also run the Belmont Film House in Aberdeen. And when we took on the Belmont three years ago, one of the first questions I was asked, and a repeated question was asked by just about all the journalists, was, oh, so you'll be bringing the film festival to Aberdeen. And you're going, well, we will probably be trying to develop a film festival that's appropriate for Aberdeen, not transplant Edinburgh International Film Festival to Aberdeen because it's a different beast. Um, but there is a demand for the expertise and skills that we have in Edinburgh and how they can be applied and deployed uh, appropriately in other parts of the country. So obviously, you know, your festival's in June, we have uh, the festivals, your festivals are in, in, in August, but the festivals work throughout the, the year. And also, I think people are probably would be surprised to know that you work across the 32 local authorities at different times. Maybe, you know, you can maybe explain a bit more, Shona, about, about that. In particular. Well, because there's a couple of things, I mean, coming back to the Expo Fund and the, the Made in Scotland platform, I mean, as, again, as a kind of outsider coming into the city, um, it's been really fascinating to see just how that whole ecosystem works. And I think it's, um, it's something that people don't realise doesn't exist everywhere. And coming from Northern Ireland, where the support for the arts and the infrastructure around the arts is being decimated at the moment, um, people look at Scotland with envy um, because you're, you're funding through Creative Scotland artists to produce and to make the work in the first place. Then you're supporting the festivals to provide this incredible platform for Scottish work to be seen and heard. Then there's support for international curators to come and see and appreciate that work. And then the kind of crowning beauty is that there's an ongoing touring fund um, so that work that is selected to go overseas can be seen um, elsewhere. And I think that whole ecosystem is what works so amazingly for here. Um, and then coming back to kind of the fringe and the work that we do right across mm -hmm. um, Edinburgh. Obviously, the, the fringe is open access, so uh, there's an open invitation there from the outset for, for any company or any artist to come and perform here. Uh, but then there are also kind of um, proactive initiatives like the Schools Poster Competition, which has been it's the longest running schools outreach program in the country. Um, and this year we had a 60% increase of schools that had never participated before. Um, and young people, the invitation was to actually design the front covers of the 70th anniversary Fringe program this year. Um, so programs like that that engage creatively both teachers uh, working with artists to um, support young people through the creative learning agenda and, and the curriculum for excellence um, are something that I think we're all um, extremely committed to and um, we're working in partnership now with Scottish Drama Training Network with Youth Theatre Arts mm -hmm. Scotland to make sure that the, that the fringe is seen as a place that's completely accessible and that's natural for any young person from here who, who sees themselves in a pathway to performance. And that's one of the, I suppose, the challenges that uh, we face in Scotland. Too many people um, 
uh, say that, uh, and, and probably justifiably, that they, they feel that the arts aren't for them because the mm. arts themselves have not been for them. And I know that's something that you know, you're very struck with as well, Fergus. It's, just, it's not just a kind of drop-in relationship you want to encourage. If we want young people and, and people who don't normally access the arts to access the arts, then we, there has to be, uh, the emphasis has to be on the arts to reach, not, not yeah. the other way around. Um, although I think people are really surprised to, he to hear that across the post schools in Edinburgh, the attendance, uh, the, the festivals and, uh, is very strong. Uh, so how do you think that that shift can take place from the festivals? Yeah, I mean, and, I, and I've started it, I know, but... I've kind of changed quite a bit on this. I learned, I think I've learned, we, we have the programme with Castlebray Community High School, and it's, the idea was, you know, we do things like the art of listening, which is really about getting all the kind of school-age children in, in Edinburgh to at least encounter, you know, classical music in some way. But this was a school that was going to close down, relatively small number of pupils, and a commitment to work with them over three years. And we really got to know them. And I have to say, I'm increasingly kind of interested in not just how wide we can spread this, but actually right. picking, you know, a, a number of people and, and trying to develop something much more profound. So that had things in it, such as we matched up people who work with us at all sorts of levels of the organization with students to do professional development. Um, and so I have to say, I think that there's a one of the biggest challenges, I, I, having spent time, I say, I, I, I think I learned more from that experience than they did, maybe. But, but that whole question of, of not just about how do, you, how do they access the arts, but what does having this kind of cultural landscape, what effect does it have on their lives? Um, and I think there's a huge question around, there's a, there's a huge offering around professional development that, that, that we can provide, but it's a, it's a real long-term commitment and I think that one of the changes I think that, that we're having conversations about within this is that this isn't really about a creative learning program. This is about fundamentally what you do. And it's fundamentally, if you really want to reach kind of a, a, a demographic or a group of people who, who have no real experience, you've got to kind of make a, at least a five-year commitment to it. Um, so. I think that that, I think for me, has been a, one of the, the big shifts in my thinking is I've always kind of thought in those terms of here's a creative learning program and here's what we'll do and we'll try to reach as many as possible. But perhaps narrow the focus and have a, a really profound effect. Um, and also in, par in parallel, but I, I, I say I, I kind of, I guess I've, I've seen really the, the enormous effect we could have, but you can't dip in and out of that. Mm. And, you know, we've been going for 70 years, so perhaps we don't need to <laughs> dip in and out. There's a strategic relationship there, and that kind of thinking can help. I think uh, our cultural strategy that we're currently working on as well as to what does that mean in Scotland, that can yeah. be a bit more uh, in-depth in that, our relationships. Um, but uh, I want to open up to uh, questions shortly, but I want to know if you have any highlights you'd like to to offer. Any uh, tickets to sell? Any tickets? No. <laughs> no, I mean, anything, has, anything either this year, yes, you want to promote it, or are any highlights in, in previous years you think are standout things from your, your respective festivals? Mm. Pick a moment, any moment. We won't judge you on it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I guess I, I did, at the moment for me is I brought a show here to the Fringe in 2001 called Bed Bound by a guy called Enda Walsh, and it sort of, you know, was sat here for a month and you know it completely changed my life and just saw saw so much work i mean there's so many pieces i could pull out david harrower's oh, you had your one. And... You had your one. <laughs> <laughs> i'm always in that awkward position if i can't choose a single show ever because of the impartiality that we have in the fringe society but i mean for me it's always just the sheer scale of opportunity um that you know the audience themselves become the curator and choose um out of this like this year, 3,300 shows, what they would like to go and see. I mean, last year, a show about um, a really beautiful mass theatre piece about Alzheimer's um, that just gave you a kind of understanding that I hadn't had before. And another show that was about suicide, but left you coming out of the space feeling joyous. I mean, how do artists do that? It's amazing. It's, a, it's the art of humanity. Yeah, yeah that's what it is. And um, it's <laughs> Uh, three years ago, I think it was. Um, you can name drop, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Sean, Sean. Um, 
The, one of the things we run each year is the, what's now the Edinburgh and Lothian Schools Film Competition, and we get about 30, 35 schools each year entering films uh, for the competition. It's across nursery, primary, secondary schools and special schools. And three years ago, there was a 35 second stop frame animation called The Rabbit Six the Cat Back Up. Um, and it was produced by uh, four nursery school kids. Um, and it was just beautifully surreal uh -huh. and quite worrying that three <laughs> uh, that these four really cute kids, and I got to give them the reward. They were, we had a big event at Film House, the big award ceremony, and uh, they sort of totter up onto the stage and you're going, blimey, you're small. And you sort of go down your knees and going, you're still small. Uh, I mean, who came up with the idea? And it was sort of like, oh. uh, just brilliant. 35 seconds. Brilliant. It's on Vimeo. The That's rabbit, it. <laughs> the rabbit sticks the cat back up. There we go. Thank you. I, I, I probably, if I had to pick one, it would be the satire of the three estates that I saw. Not in 1948, because I'm not that old. Um, but actually, it must have been the 90s, early 90s. It was a, must, I'm not sure if it was Fringe Festival. It was festival. one of the mid 80s, I think. Uh, 80s. Um, I should remember, because it was the first ever date I had with my husband. <laughs> so we will now open up to questions. Um, we have roving mics. A uh, gentleman with the white shirt, this one at the back there was blue. We'll come to you after as well. Maybe one over here would be easier if that's okay. Is anybody over here? No, it's a gentleman with the blue after. Yeah, thanks. I say your name as well. Be Benjamin Carey of the Tourism Society. Um, people often think that UNESCO is just a cultural organisation. But it was established in 45 after the war, and it's all about it's about building peace. Culture is just a, a, a an instrument. The cabinet secretary reminded us at the beginning that your your festivals all began in the shadow of World War II. Can you explain how that changes the way you operate? What makes your heritage more than just? a bunch of interesting cultural festivals. <laughs> That's why is it important? <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, part of this is it just, I think it, it happens subliminally. Um, and I suppose so given, given it's the 70th anniversary, I think we're very conscious at the moment of, of the idea of kind of that happened in 1947, which was that I suppose, you know, culture, but in, 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 the, in a very specific sense, classicism essentially, provided some sort of north star to take us back to to decency um, and i think that in the, in that sense I, I think that you will always certainly see kind of with the international festival kind of there there are continual touchstones um, but i think i think artists actually do respond to that and i think it's one of the reasons they come to the festival and i think it's one of the reasons there are repertoire choices and there are kind of programming choices which do come back to that idea about kind of human decency, which sounds, as I say, a little old fashioned in some ways, probably less so at the moment. But I, 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 can, I can feel that gravitational pull from a programmatic point of view in terms of Edinburgh. And I can feel a kind of a way in which the, the audience responds to that idea of there being a sort of an inherent human decency, which comes out by responding to kind of, you know, these, these seminal texts or seminal pieces of music. So you know, there are there are seven stories in the world, or there are repeat kind of the, the point that that's a lodestone to which people can connect. Yeah, I think I think that's true, and you know that in it's a whole other conversation, which is very interesting about why that became a problem in the first year, and perhaps why the fringe came out, which was the idea that there was a fixed canon of which Scottish work was not part. Mm. Um, and, and just interesting, you know, the, the raging debate that existed within that, and perhaps one of the very interesting debates that always exists within festivals, which is how much should it reflect the place and how much should it reflect the world. Um, and so, so I think there's, there, there are incredible strengths with that, but, you know, it's not without its complications. Okay, I mean, I come back again to the kind of open access, the uncensored, the... Um, you know, that kind of heritage of um, anyone who, who wants to put on a, a show being able to come here and be part of it. Do you think everybody is conscious of that heritage who takes part? Or is it, you know, how, how is it in the fringe in particular? How do you think that? Um, 
I think there is, there is something in that word fringe that has been adopted around the world now um, that, I mean, you know, it doesn't exist actually in China, but now they're, they're talking about developing Chinese fringe festivals because it's, it's, <laughs> it's a word that means, um, that means kind of on the edge or new discovery or political. Mm. It's, um, it's, yes, it's, it's the edge yeah. part of it. Yeah. I, th I think it's the fact that we've got a route that is beyond just being a showcase. The showcase bit's really important. But the fact that we can draw that line back to the, the starting point, that the starting point was more than just that, I think is really important. One of the things that the film festival's done is we, I don't know if we introduced or developed, but we certainly uh, took the notion of a retrospective that historically was never there. Why would you do a retrospective on a relatively new art form? But 70 years down the line, one of the key aspects of the film festival each year is we'll do one or two retrospectives, which is very much about understanding the evolution of film as an art form and where it sits in society and where it sits in people's lives and how we have changed how we tell stories. If you look at some of the films that we do screen from the retrospectives, you're going, blimey, that's quite staid and turgid in some regards, but also completely different, a different universe. And it's quite a... Uh, I think it's that the fact that we've got that route is runs all the way through to the present day and it's not that we're always looking backwards but it's just how do we then take that into the future. Gentleman at the back was the I think it's, I think it's a blue shirt. Evening all, uh, my name is Dave Clark. Um, in most roundups of this sort there are two organisations whose contribution to the success of the festival is pretty much paramount, but they tend to be overlooked. I have in mind Edinburgh University and, God help us, the City of Edinburgh Council. Would our panellists like to say a few words on their relationships with those two organisations and if there are any ways in which they would like the relationship to evolve, improve, change in any way? Okay, and perhaps you could talk about your vision for the future as part of that. <laughs> oh, me? <laughs> yes, Fergus, why don't you answer um, that? Well, I mean, the City of Edinburgh Council, I think, I mean, the way I always have to think about this is that is also the people of Edinburgh. And the people of Edinburgh and the people of Scotland have been paying for this thing for many, many years. So, you know, there's, there, there are people who are kind of, there's the institution, but we also have to pay tribute to the fact that it is kept faith with the festivals for all of this time. Um, I think that, um, I mean, I, so, so yeah, I often, I often think within the context of a City of Edinburgh Council is, is, is quite a whipping boy in this city. Um, perhaps you could say with good cause in certain areas, but at other times I, I don't think it gets the credit it deserves. Um, and I have to say that one of the things is that, that I find incredibly refreshing about here is regardless of, you know, difficulties in relation to funding or whatever else, the rhetoric is always incredibly positive about culture and about the festivals, and that's not the case everywhere else. Um, I think we've got, with the, with the City of Edinburgh Council, I think there's a big discussion, a big strategic discussion to be had about the city and about the growth and development of the festivals, and, and, and that is part of all sorts of other conversations, particularly around tourism, um, and I think that that is an area that needs a sort of a, a platform at the moment. And perhaps if I was to say, if there's one area that I would like to see the CC leading on, it is in terms of the, the development of heritage, culture and so forth and the festivals. How are we going to do that in a way which enriches the, the city more broadly rather than sort of continually puts pressure on one small part of the city? Um, in relation to the university, I mean, we have a very healthy and, um, you know, friendly relationship with the university, but I would not say it is, you know, as extensive as we would like it to be. I mean, obviously what the university does is it creates a kind of a, an intellectual platform in this city which um, allows us to do a lot of different types of work which we wouldn't be able to do. Um, obviously, it, a, there is quite a lot of infrastructure, but... I would certainly welcome a more far-reaching relationship with the university over the next few years. And it was interesting, and in, in discussing with Tim O'Shea uh, a few years back, uh, his desire to have more of a connection between town and gown, but particularly through the festivals. And obviously his role was in uh, 
the, the society in, in previous years have been very important. I, I once uh, described the university as the biggest empresario in terms of uh, venues and space, but it, I think it's, the question is more than that. It's actually about um, you know, not just venue aspects or space aspects, it's about relationships that can take the festivals forward. Yeah, I mean, I might say we've very strong relationships with both the university and with the City of Edinburgh Council, but the Fringe is a very different business model in that it is the promoters and the venues right across the Fringe that take all of the kind of financial risk. So uh, whilst the relationships are, are brilliant and much more than just the financial aspect, um, I, I think there's also a cautionary note in that with a business model like the Fringe, if costs keep escalating in terms of rent of venues and hire of spaces and licensing fees etc it does endanger the future of that particular kind of model so i think the relationships are good the relationships are strong um, simply the fringe wouldn't happen without the um, kind of patronage of the university um, and its support as a landlord the biggest landlord on the fringe um, and also without the support of the officers and councillors within council but i think th those relationships need to be constantly reviewed and renewed and refreshed in order to keep us competitive and 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 keep a landscape where these festivals can still happen and if you look internationally uh, perhaps there are other cities where there can be more alignment between the institutions themselves and perhaps in edinburgh that it strikes me that edinburgh has, is full of uh, very important institutions but many of them and so therefore how you can work strategically that is quite a challenge but maybe we've seen good examples uh, internationally of, of cities that seem to get their act together in a very strong strategic way is there anybody that you can think of off the top of your head that we might want to be discussing yeah. That's such a good question. Um, I'm avoiding so, so, Edinburgh, have you noticed this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Other than Edinburgh. Um, I think the, from the film side, a, a city like Toronto has embraced film, uh, both the production and the consumption of it, if you like. So with the Toronto International Film Festival, which actually modelled itself on Edinburgh 43 years ago, because it was that mixture of showcase, that mixture of retrospective, that mi mixture of bringing industry together with audiences and so on. Um, but in a city of five million uh, yeah, and at the so same time yeah. recognizing that they're an hour flight from new york and have massively developed their production base so they are in effect an awful lot of u.s cities and films will be toronto um, and recognizing the two things go hand in hand so it's, it's the economic aspect and the cultural and the aspect culture. working together and in the debates that i referenced uh, that we had in the parliament in june you know, i paid tribute to the you know the initial uh, uh, civic leaders then, as I did in my opening remarks, so I'd like to also pay tribute to the Edinburgh City Council now. And over the years, they've had festivals champions who've worked very hard and to make sure you had political leadership as well. So I think, I think that is something that we can also contribute in terms of this debate. Is there any questions over here? Um, lady in the centre. And I'll take one final one after that, if there's anybody else. You're sitting right in the middle. <laughs> Okay, and the gentleman in the middle there. Yes. Uh, hello, uh, Sheila Scobie. Hello, Sheila. Hello. Um, I'd like to ask a question um, relating to the title of this evening's event, which is innovation. Uh, I'd just like to ask you what the trends are in innovation across the arts festival community and how you're keeping up with them. Okay. Who'd like to? I don't have to go first all the time. No, no. <laughs> well, as I said earlier, part of the challenge in, in the film universe is, is the shift onto digital. One of the uh, biggest challenges is, is the shift onto streaming platforms. And uh, you'll have noticed earlier in the year at Cannes that there was a falling out between Cannes Film Festival yeah, yeah. and indeed the French government and Netflix um, about what, is, what constitutes a film yeah. and what constitutes a theatrical release and therefore uh, whether it, it should be up for awards and should be in a film festival or not. We've always been much more relaxed about that. Um, I say always, certainly in the 40 years I remember of, of being at the film festival. Because as you look at what Netflix are involved in producing these days, they are bypassing the old business model. And rather than fighting against it, you go, how do you work with it? And so this year we had two or three Netflix titles in the festival. Last year we had another three or four. We've often been a, a platform for the release of high-end uh, TV drama, so showing the first two or three episodes of a, of a new series. So about four or five years ago, we had the first couple of episodes of Peaky Blinders, for example. Um, Recognising that 
film isn't just film anymore. It's a shorthand for the whole of the, the moving image, the screen sector. Um, but we have to be aware of that. We have to not get ourselves tied in knots with that. We have to not do what Can did, because you're just going at slightly suicidal if you become too snobbish and prissy about it. But it's also about how we can learn from it on the industry side. And so this year, one of the key focuses for the industry programme was around the future of film distribution and how we can work with producers and distributors and exhibitors in ensuring that people continue to be able to make a living, but it might mean they need, might need to change how they think about doing that. Okay, so that's, uh, and maybe I'll ask, ask the, the gentleman to ask his question and perhaps we can both reflect on both questions, if that's okay, as we draw this to an end. My final, is, is it the final question? Um, uh, yeah, yeah, yes. It What's probably your name, will sir? be. Uh, I, I apologise, it's a very journalistic question, but then I'm a journalist. So what's your name, sir? Paul Coburn. Hello, Paul. Uh, what do you think the festivals, your festivals, will be like in 2047? <laughs> that's a brilliant question. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, that's a question that through Fringe Central um, we're asking very openly because... Um, it's not a question that the Fringe Society can answer or should answer uh, because the Fringe is made up of um, so many constituent parts. So we have two sessions in Fringe Central this year where we're literally asking that question. What could, should or might be the future of the Fringe? And what is the role that the society can play in that? Um, so it's, uh, you know... Who knows? But I'm really excited to hear what kind of responses come back. But and and just in relation to the other question, I think, you know, I, I think self determination is 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 a a big thing in terms of the arts and the whole idea of kind of um, immersive and experiential and art without walls and without boundaries. And I think the fringe speaks very well to that. And I often kind of get asked, well, why is the fringe not? In more in Leith or why is it not more in Craig Miller and that's not what it's about it's it's an invitation that if if performers promoters artists in Leith want to be part of it then that's up to them to decide it's certainly not for us to impose or determine uh, what might be right for Leith for example but we did open that conversation this year and what was right for Leith was could you ever just put a map of Leith into the program so we did <laughs> and could you ever put a collection point for tickets in Leith so we did um, so I, I guess that's kind of the direction and the increasing kind of direction of travel for us always is it's it's about being responsive it's about being reactive but empowering people to decide what they want for themselves Okay, final comment? I mean, I think the, the biggest innovation, I would say, in festivals is, I'm going to start talking myself out of a job here, is, is just the, is around curation. And I don't just mean actual the selection, but it's actually much more collaborative. And the idea of a single person who is defining what culture is or how it sort of imbues it with some sort of value is, is completely breaking down. I would say that... Um, both you will you will see organizations like the festival woven in with other organizations much more closely um, creating programs over multiple years which reflects many many different voices obviously that has to be coherent but i think that the way they the way that kind of institutions are putting programs together is changing and um, and, and I think that you will see far more voices coming through rather than it being sort of the preserve of, of one or two people. Um, in terms of 2047, um, I mean, one of the questions that I'm really interested in is, you know, not to be afraid of growth. Um, and this idea of, you know, this, I mean, 20 years ago, people were sort of saying, there's too many people, it's got too big, you know. The fact of the matter is we're going to see huge changes in relation to automation in terms of the way people are employed. We're so blessed to have heritage, to have the universities, to have the cultural sector and to have the festivals because they need the engagement of a lot of people. Um, and we shouldn't be scared of the fact that we could, that the festival can offer an awful lot more to Scotland and it can continue to grow and that it hasn't sort of reached capacity. But where it grows, you know, as I say, if you're, if you're in Craig Miller or if you're in Gorgie, you may not think the festival has grown too big if what you're looking for is kind of sustained economic growth and employment. And, and, and I think we can do a hell of a lot more to enrich. And I don't, I don't think the sort of the stories of the festivals has, has sort of leveled out. I think there's an awful lot more for them to give. 
So for the longest continuously running <laughs> film festival, <laughs> Ken, you get the, the, the last answer. Um, I, I think the key thing is it irrelevant because it would be so easy to go, yeah, we're pretty good. We attract lots of people. We do lots of good stuff. Let's, let's sit back. And it's just, I don't know what it'll look like in 2047, but it, it is unlikely to be the same as now. But it's entirely dependent on us being open to new ideas, new ways of working, increased levels of collaboration from the film festival side. One of the things we've done more and more over the last few years is A, promoting film as an art form in its own right, but very much focusing on film as always a collaboration of other art forms. And therefore events, so we did the event with the RSNO this year, over the last three years, a, a D scored screening of a film and the RSNO performing the, the, the score live is something that breaks down that, that barrier. And it's to, I think the final bit is it's about interaction, human interaction. People like coming together. And however automated the world is, however digital the world is, people like coming into spaces, communal spaces, sharing that experience. We just have to ensure the experiences are world, continue to be world class. And in a world where the D, when our video was meant to kill off cinema, it never did because of that live experience. Yeah. In 2047, I still expect to be alive. Um, <laughs> um, but I do think there is something about that live experience, but we have no idea what that live experience will be. It will be in a com completely technologically different scenario as it is just now. But I, I think we can all look forward to the future. I think we can celebrate the past. I think the contributions we've heard today have given you an insight into personal reflections from the current three directors. But uh, in thanking them, can we also uh, thank the chief executives and the directors of the founding festivals right through from uh, the early days in 1947. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us this evening. I understand there is a reception that you can uh, further partake of. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us this evening uh, for this moment, this very brief moment, but an important moment in reflecting on the 70th anniversary of the International Festivals. Thank you very before, much. Before, sorry, just before you clap, um, I just wanted to jump in there and say that there is another birthday. It's not a 70th uh. birthday, <laughs> but there is another birthday. Captain Secretary, a very happy birthday to you from all of us. <laughs> Happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Thank you very much. <laughs>